And now, our feature presentation. The game you're about to see is danger. Pure, undiluted danger. So don't try it. This is Pine Valley Creek Bridge near San Diego, California. It's more than 300 feet to the ground below. In a few moments, daredevil Jim Tyler will use the bridge as part of a death-defying performance. From the back of a truck going 70 miles an hour, Jim will jump off the bridge and then parachute to the valley floor below. There he goes. The chute's open just in time. Now Jim must brace himself for the dangerous landing. He's down. John Davison. Tonight, a lot more that's incredible. A story of stamina, speed, and incredible courage. This 18-year-old girl is a high school track star, and she's totally blind. How does she do it? I'm Fran Tarkenton. Yeah. When you were a kid, did you have a secret language like ite, antile? Well, you ain't heard nothing yet. All of the uh, tweeds at the heath's uh, heart boot. And uh, I had to learn it in self-defense. Bootling is much more than a secret language. It is a part of the life of every person in Boonville. I'm Kathy Lee Crosby. <laughs> Tonight, a quick, quiet, and painless end to ugly teeth. Now, we'll not only see an incredible new way of creating beautiful teeth in only one day in the dentist chair, but we'll see a demonstration of the method here in the studio. And we're going to visit a house no respectable ghost would haunt because he might get his nice white sheet all dirty. This is Dara Robinson heading towards a wooden ramp at 70 miles an hour. One miscalculation or a split second error in timing could easily mean disaster. A mixture of vitamins, minerals, and sodium bicarbonate sounds like a new way to cure a hangover. Well, it isn't. It's a revolutionary formula to help break your smoking habit. The cure is a series of well-placed shots. And there'll be lots more that's incredible on That's Incredible. That's incredible. Many of the people who have performed sensational stunts on our show have been professionals, risking their neck as their business. Jim Tyler, who took that death-defying leap from a speeding truck, is not a professional. He's a criminal investigator with the Internal Revenue Service. And we'd like you to meet him right now. Jim, you know, we're always warning people on our show not to try dangerous stunts unless they're professionals. What made you do it? Well, John, although I'm not a professional stuntman, and no one's ever done this particular stunt before, I have been skydiving for six years. Oh. I have over 700 parachute jumps. Really? But, Jim, did you practice this stunt before you tried it? Well, not exactly this stunt, but I have made two previous bridge jumps practicing, and these were jumps where I stood on the edge of the bridge and jumped off. I actually made one jump from a bridge that was only 200 feet high. Uh, you know, I may be wrong, but when I was watching you, just before you jumped uh, over the rail, I, th I thought I saw your foot slip. Yes, as I started to jump off the platform, my left foot does slip, which contributes quite a bit to the jump. That's great. Why don't we watch it again, and you can explain exactly what happened, okay? Okay. How did you know when to jump? Well, the flag that, you j that just went by was my mark for the jump. I tried to get as far over the bridge as I could when I made the jump, and my foot slipped, which caused me to lose my balance. And at this, at, at this point in the jump, I'm, I'm already, I've already lost my balance. I'm starting to go over on my back, so I'm fighting to get back as the parachute deploys behind me. Were you scared at that point? Not at that point. I was before I jumped, but at this time I had a lot of work to do. So I wasn't, uh, didn't have time to be scared, I don't think. Uh -huh. 
Well, how fast are you traveling now, just before the parachute opened? you have any idea? Well, the truck was going 75 miles an hour at the time I jumped, and I relied on the forward speed of the truck to open the parachute behind me. All right. Now you're looking for a place to land. Like, you can control that a little bit, huh? A little bit, but uh, the terrain down at the bottom was pretty rough. I really didn't have too much control over where I was going to land. Every week we've asked you to write and tell us about anything incredible that you've seen or been a part of. Your letters have been incredible. The letter we received from Ed Mulvin of Des Moines, Iowa was only five lines long, but what a wonderfully heartwarming and incredible story he packed into those five lines. Ed wrote, The young girl in the photograph is Sheila Holsworth, an 18-year-old track star runner for Dowling High School in Des Moines, Iowa. She is totally blind. At that point in Ed's letter, we knew we had to find out more about this courageous young runner. Meet Sheila Hallsworth of Des Moines, Iowa. She's a bright 18-year-old high school student and a superb athlete. In addition to being an excellent rider, she's a good water skier and a top sprinter on the school track team. Sheila is extremely fond of animals, especially dogs, and in school, She's an active student with consistently good grades. Her life is perfectly normal, except for one startling fact. Sheila is totally blind. Her blindness resulted from a freakish accident, which occurred when she was 10. The orthodontic headgear she was wearing broke and flew into her eyes. Her mother remembers Sheila's reaction well. The accident was much more traumatic for me and for my husband and for the rest of the family than it was for Sheila because she had no doubt that life was going on as well as it had before and she gave us the courage to continue our life and to have it be the same normal life that it was before. She was never depressed, never discouraged, would never get down. In fact, when she went to Boston for eye surgery, and found out that she would not be able to see, she told the doctor, she said, I'm fine and I'm healthy and my dad's a doctor and I'm going home. And she did. She was in the hospital four days and she went home and that was it. Life was going on, sighted or not. Always an avid rider, Sheila has not let her blindness keep her from that pleasure. All she needs in order to ride are some occasional directions. Sheila's greatest passion has always been for running track. Incredibly, she still does it with the aid of a radio over which she is given directions. Are you ready, Sheila? Any time. Nice, keep it going. That's great, left, left, that's fine. Keep it going, right, that's 50, right. Good, you're right in the middle. Right. 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 CQ, CQ, calling CQ, 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 calling CQ. Edward J. Mulvin, a ham radio enthusiast, developed the radio system that Sheila uses for running. As a professional photographer, I have worked for the Holsworth family and uh, known uh, all the kids up there. Worked, uh, did uh, Michael and Mary's senior portraits. And uh, a mutual friend had mentioned the fact that Sheila wanted to run track and they wanted to know if we could wire her for sound because I was also an amateur radio operator. I'm supposed to know about all this stuff. Basically, all I do is I tell Sheila right or left. I use a radio, I transmit a signal, and she hears it in a receiver that is, well, the original one was in the headband in the back of her head, and the new one now that uh, we have is uh, clipped on her belt and back. And it's just a simple transistor radio earphone that carries the sound from the receiver to her headband where the uh, ear holes are fitted. And it's uh, very, very extremely simple. Guided only by Ed's voice, Sheila can practice for the 100-yard dash. In track, since I've been in high school track, freshman year and sophomore year, I ran by myself because I didn't have the technique down 
you know, listening and running hard at the same time. And quite frequently, I take up the whole track. And then starting last year, they put somebody in lane one, and they put me in lane three, and then somebody in lane six. And then this year, they put some. They put uh, the whole track was full except for the lanes on either side of me. And this year, I've done a good job of staying in my lane. I'm a senior at Dowling right now, and next year I plan on going to college and running track. And I think I'd like to go into psychology, maybe physical therapy. And after college, I'd like to settle down and like anybody, raise a family and to stay involved in my sports. I think Sheila very definitely has been an aid to the blind community and probably to the sighted community. I think she's broken down a lot of barriers. I think that if she had to lose her sight, I think this is God's plan for her to break down barriers, to give blind people opportunities, and uh, to make a better world for the blind. Ladies and gentlemen, Sheila Holdsworth. If you're one of those three-pack-a-day people who want to stop smoking but can't, you'll be pleased to know that help may be on the way. The needle may be scary, but it's turned nicotine fiends into no pack a dayers You won't find the language you're about to hear in a dictionary. I'll tell you, Kimmy, I don't want a Harper Simon Miller on you. I'm nematodes here. I don't think I can do you any good. Uh, you got me shark. Why was that man talking like that? <laughs> the answer to that question is very funny and very incredible. The world's record for a ramp-to-ramp -ramp motorcycle jump is 190 feet. Dar Robinson is one of the finest movie stuntmen. Tonight, he has planned something truly incredible just for our show. All that and much, much more in just a minute on That's Incredible. Did you know that there's a place in Northern California where everyone speaks a secret language? An old ranching town, Boonville, sits in the Anderson Valley, about 100 miles north of San Francisco. The Horn of Z's coffee shop is a favorite gathering spot, a place where a boont can be heard. Oh, yeah, he piped to you, can uh, shovel two strung him, but he still harps, he's plenty heel scratchy. Heel scratchy, huh. that's ball yeah. harps and boots, you know. Yeah. I just beat here in the local Greeley that our local high healer is side the region. Oh, Where man, uh, there'll be a big string and Oh, well, there'll be lots of barling, you know. You bet. Uh, that's nice. Gorms or Zee? Let's see. No, that's nonch. That's, that's nonch out there. I tell you, Kimmy, I don't want a harp of miller on you. I'm demon toads here. I don't think I can do you any good. Uh, you got me shark. What are you going to help me? I'm kind of lost. Everybody speak a strange language here. High healers and boot, all heart boot lane. Uh, can you tell me how I can get out of this town? Bike to Japeway to the Briny. I'd like to welcome you to Boonville. Historically, uh, uh, the very beginning of Boonville was in 1888. And uh, uh, it was ball to harp on the bright lighters and shark them. And uh, from that, uh, uh, it kept going to where the language is what it is today. The men didn't want the women to know that they were saying awful things and whatnot, and so they created this language so the women didn't know what they were talking about. But the women were smarter than they thought, and so the women began to talk a little bit of their own language. At the any time saloon around the turn of the century, Boot was harped by the young Kimmies, and um, it added words more phrases and um, a sharkly uh, bright lighters that came in for a horn and finally it got up to the time when i was uh yanked piking to the heese um, all of the uh, tweeds at the heese uh heart boot and uh, i had to learn it in self-defense well, I learned it generally from listening to my mom and dad, and also when they converse with other booners, I'd have to uh, pick some up if I wanted to get along. He liked it, and I figured that if I wanted to, you know, know what he was talking about to his friends, that I'd have to learn it. Bootling is much more than a secret language. 
It is a part of the life of every person in Boonville. Boonville has an incredible history all its own, as you'll discover. We're at a monthly meeting of the Boonlingers Club, a group of Boonville residents who love to get together and speak Boont. Fifty years ago, the Boont language began to die out. Today, it's having a renaissance and developing a literature. This is a poem, an uh, ode to the Jeffrey of Wheezes by Donald Hitty Pardini. I stepped out of the nook on that pearly nilch. Muzz Creek was piking and running a hilch. Muzz Creek was piking and running a hilch. Booners were slugging, not a harem harp. She's plenty cow scully out there in the dark. It, the language itself was perpetuated by uh, the Booners uh, in various methods. This song was written by Booner Tom Phillips of Palico. <laughs> Just a short pipe from the old briny. You'll be in the land of the besom tree. We're just slow loping in a besom tree. A horn of hitch and cotton buckeye. There ain't no bower where you can be, can be. A slow loping in a besom tree. We got volcanoes and crappie corn. And plenty rooty nests for ski horns. Piped on to the boom on a high man's day. There'll be a butcher match and anyone can play. We're just slow loping in a basin tree. You'll dig on the jay boys horn and steinberg. Might see a root eye. Come on, come on, play ball. Slow loping in a basin tree. Slow loping in a basin tree. That's evil stringing. The everyday life of a movie stuntman is filled with such routine jobs as diving through a plate glass window, crashing a car into a wall, dropping from the top of a skyscraper into a safety airbag. Dar Robinson is one of the finest movie stuntmen. Tonight he has planned something truly incredible just for our show. And he'll also take us backstage to show us how he did it. My name is Dar Robinson. I'm a professional motion picture stuntman and have been for just over 14 years now. I have currently 15 world records and world firsts. We have 30 vans lined up here. The entire jump should take a total of, oh, somewhere in the area of about two and a half seconds. Dar begins with a practice run. Before he attempts his death-defying feat, he must be confident that his motorcycle is capable of performing well enough to reach the critical speed. Another trial run. Now it's time for the real thing. In the final seconds before he starts, Dar can only hope that he is totally prepared. One miscalculation or a split second error in timing could easily mean disaster. There he goes. He's about to jump. His motorcycle's exploded, but he survived. David. Stay tuned to find out how. Just so you remember what happened after Dar Robinson left the ramp on his motorcycle. Let's review that explosive moment. There's only one person who can tell us exactly what happened in midair, and that's our star stuntman, Dar Robinson. <laughs> Dar, now that we've shown our audience what they think they saw, what did they actually see? Well, John, I think the best way to explain it is to show everybody the jump from another angle. I think we have that film here. Okay. You'll notice that the ramps are actually behind the vans. They're not directly over the vans. And those cardboard boxes there are what I'm going to land in, so I'm not going to fall on the ground. Uh -huh. 
They're filled with excelsior. Uh -huh. <laughs> Here you come. Of course, still, if you don't hit that ramp just right, you'd be in trouble, wouldn't you? Yes, very much. Yeah. The explosion covers you, doesn't it? Yes, it does. In fact, uh, actually, it singed uh, little bits of the hair on my neck and uh, a few other things, yeah. So how did you go about making the whole thing work the way it did? Well, first off, Kathy Lee, it's not something that I'd want to do every day. There was an awful lot of preparation that went into it. Those are my guys filling the boxes that'll cushion my fall. I want you to kind of explain to them exactly how this motorcycle is set up and what this is, what it appears to be, and what it actually is. Well, actually, it's not a fuel tank. It's a dummy fuel tank, and it's uh, made out of styrofoam. And we have some fire bombs placed in each side of this uh, tank. Um, we have an ignition-type uh, uh, dead man switch on the other side here in the handlebar, which we hook to uh, Dar's wrist. And when Dar comes off the motorcycle, after he's jerked off, uh, we will have a, a fire explosion here through fire bombs. Okay, this cable is attached to a special harness in which I'm wearing. The other end of it is attached to a special decelerative, decelerative device, not to the local tree. Now, when I get off the ramp, you'll notice that the cable will start to pull me off. At that time, it pulls on the line which is attached to my wrist, breaking the contact points, and it's creating the explosion which you see. So actually, what you're seeing is in reverse of what you really think you see. Here it is in slow motion now. Maybe you can describe it once again. Okay, now we're leaving the ramp. And from this point on, I'm waiting for the cable to hit. There, it's starting to come in. Now it pulls my hands off, and there's your explosion as contact points come together. That's right. Now, what happened there is I was decelerated from a little over 60 miles an hour to nothing in about 25 feet and about two-tenths of a second. Oh. So this is something that's never been done also. Here it is once again. Where are those cables now? Would you run over them? No, it's being dragged behind me. It's uh, oh. kind of est on the ground there so that it uh, doesn't get hung up on anything. We've shown you how I do it. Please, don't ever try it. There's a lot of preparation that goes into this, and it is very dangerous. Smoking is a truly deadly habit. As the Surgeon General says, cigarette smoking is dangerous to your health. There are as many ways to break the habit as there are brands of cigarettes. Right, Kathy Lee? Have you tried to stop smoking? Yes, I have. Still trying. <laughs> Still trying, obviously. So what did you, what have you tried? What method? Oh, that uh, stop one step at a time. I got as high as a four step and I gave up. <laughs> the doctor told me to stop or else. I stopped. Uh, prayer and uh, willpower. You, sir, did you? Yeah, I had uh, open heart surgery seven weeks ago and the uh, doctor said, uh, you smoking? I said, yes. And he said, you just smoked your last cigarette. What methods have you tried? I tried using est philosophy and I moved to Maui for a year and stay away from all smokers. Stop smoking and start eating. <laughs> How'd you do it? I started drinking. <laughs> Kathy Lee? Please pay attention to this next piece of film about a special doctor from Maryland who has developed an incredible new cure for smoking. This is it. That's the last one. Oddly, the majority of people that call are interested in a magic cure. And once you tell them that it's not magic, they're not interested in it. When they realize that they themselves have a great role to play, nine out of ten people are no longer interested in it. And I suppose I've smoked a couple packs a day for probably longer than I realized. But I came here because smoking really bothers me. The uh, emphysema is starting to get to me now. Um, when I was first told about the emphysema three years ago. I didn't think it could possibly happen to me. Smoking is both a physical addiction and a psychological addiction. I've tried to quit cold turkey, but I just haven't quit that way. So here we are. This is it. I pray to God that I will stop smoking. I'm thinking very positively on this because it does mean my life. They come from all over the world to a clinic in Baltimore, Maryland, where Dr. Neil Solomon has developed a unique new cure for the habit of smoking. My name is Joey Winters. I'm 38 years old. I've come all the way from California to Baltimore to quit smoking. I've been smoking for 25 years, 
and I'm ready to quit. With the help of this cure and this doctor, I can throw away cigarettes forever. The, the solution that I inject into the patients is a solution that I make from various known solutions, solutions of vitamins, solutions of minerals, solution of procaine. You put them together at the right proportion, and that is what's injected. The man who first discovered this found it purely by accident. He was injecting patients with the same solution for arthritis. And as a side effect, what they were saying is they had lost their desire for cigarettes. This is it. There are no more programs available. This is the end of the line. There's nothing else available to me. I've tried everything. This is it. Here we go. Why you inject in the nose and ears? Because those points are acupuncture points that are used for people who want to stop smoking. You just put acupuncture needles there. The idea was that if you get some modicum of success, even though it's low from acupuncture, still would be worthwhile to incorporate that success in with the success you get from this treatment. The only part of it that's an experiment is the part to see whether the medication stops people from smoking. The drug components that are used are all perfectly safe components that have been used for years and years and years. There's no new or experimental drug here. These are all old drugs that have been around, and they consist of vitamins and minerals and procaine, which is nothing but novocaine. It's what your dentist gives you when he injects a numbing medicine into your gums. So that part of it is new. The only experimental part is it's a new use for old drugs. Okay. Did you tear? Yeah. It's, it won't work if you don't tear. Yeah. Give me some Kleenex, please. Right now, do you have any big physical craving for smoking a cigarette right at this minute? None. All right. Physically, your craving will be no greater than it is now, only less. So if you can be successful the way you are now, continue that way, then you have it made. Thank okay. you. Now, we've looked at them for almost a year period. Now, our people are terribly highly motivated. And going out to almost a year and putting them all together, we have 76% of the people who have stopped smoking 24% who have not stopped smoking. You be a good soldier and you don't move. This will sting a little bit. In our incredible future, what is our house going to be like? How about this? A home that feeds our pets, turns on all the lights, and sorts our dirty socks. In fact, can control itself. Someday, door keys will be a thing of the past. And this is the way that all of us will get into the house. Welcome to Awatuki. Welcome to Awatuki. Awatuki is an Indian word that means house of dreams. It's also the name of an incredible futuristic house near Phoenix, Arizona. Designed by the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, Awa Tuki gives us a glimpse of life to come. One day, for example, every home will have an electronic brain. This is where it all begins. This is Tuki, the brains of the house. Actually, it's a very sophisticated microcomputer system. I am Tuki, see the way us see house. I am and say, hello, Cassie. Tuki is all around the house. There are three terminals like this in the master bedroom, the kitchen, and here in the sitting room. From these terminals, you can keep your finger on the pulse of the house. You ain't seen nothing yet. Carefully built to make use of its setting, the house gets most of its energy from a system of solar panels. Inside, the computer constantly monitors the temperature of every room. If it gets a little too warm, windows are automatically opened. The computer also calculates the amount of energy which the house is using. If energy is being wasted, lights and utilities are programmed to shut off. Sensors turn lights on when you enter a room, 
and off again when you leave. Television cameras provide an around-the-clock security and surveillance system. If an intruder enters the house, he is automatically detected and the police are summoned. The presence of smoke or fire is also automatically known by sensors in the ceiling. Fire, 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 fire. And if the children want a new playmate, there's always one around. Mary had a little plan. It's please plus life as snow and everywhere that Mary went. The plan was sure to go. Our two keys architect is Charles Schiffner. We can no longer afford to build as we have. We can no longer afford to live the way that we have. We are facing great transitions, many challenges, and we have to look at alternatives. How can we use the computer to free us instead of enslave us? And we have to look forward or we're going to be left behind and be archaic fossils on the desert. Farewell. Please come again. That's incredible. You know, guys, there's only one thing I'd like to know about that computer house. Does it do windows? <laughs> Several weeks ago, we showed you a new form of painless dentistry that uses acupressure. Well, there's another amazing dental technique that quickly fixes imperfect teeth. This new technique is called tooth bonding, and it was pioneered by Dr. Erwin Smigel of New York City. It's a technique which not only obliterates pain, but it also lets your teeth be reshaped or your unsightly teeth renewed and renovated in a fraction of the time that it once took. Well, I think from the first moment I entered Dr. Smigel's office, um, the, I got an incredible surge of I might be different really one day. I mean, for years it had been a fantasy to have white teeth. What we're going to do in your particular case is we're going to change the color of the teeth and change the shape. I think it would be easier if I showed you some slides to give you an idea as to what bonding can do. This poor girl is missing the two teeth alongside the front teeth. Now, it seems impossible. If we filled the space, the teeth would be gigantic. With bonding, something can be done. Watch. I made the two eye teeth to look like the teeth that should be there, and I closed the space between the centrums. One visit, look what we did. That's incredible. Now, I'm going to show you a case similar to yours. Look at this young lady. Do you see how dark the teeth are and how irregular they are? One visit, look at what we did. See that? The way we lengthened the teeth and lightened them? Wow. And that's the way she left. Well, I can't wait to start, but tell me, Dr. Smigel, does it hurt? <laughs> oh, not at all. That's the beauty of this. I don't grind your teeth at all. What we do is we actually bond the material directly to your teeth. Dr. Smigel begins by cleaning and then preparing the surface of the teeth so that they will readily accept the bonding material. Well, Lisa, now we're going to do the bonding. There's a certain amount of energy in roughening the enamel the way we do. And this liquid is absolutely absorbed by the tooth. Similar to what we used to call capillary action. An ultraviolet light is used to permanently harden the bonding material, which is a composite made of plastic, stones, and finely ground glass. The ultraviolet process sets each layer of the material before the next layer is added. Dr. Smigel opaques out the dark color of the teeth. The bonding material is transparent, and the pigment, which can be mixed to any shade, will give the teeth a completely natural color. Okay. Very good, Tanya. As soon as the light goes off, I'm going to let you see this. You'll see a truly tremendous difference. And now I'm going to shape the tooth 
and I'm going to make it to the length, the line we wanted it, and to the color we wanted it to be. We put this material on by layers. We make sure each one is condensed into the next. Dr. Smigel carefully grinds the newly bonded teeth into the exact shape that he wants them to have. Ready? Susan, what do you think of this? Beautiful. I'm so happy. You're really a good patient. I'm really very pleased. Believe it or not, for the first time, you're going to see yourself completely finished. Watch. Here's the mirror. <laughs> Did you ever look like this in your life? No, they're great. Uh, I'm very pleased. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're great. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thank you. This dramatic and incredible change in the appearance of Lisa's teeth was accomplished by Dr. Smigel in only six hours and without a bit of pain. What we just saw is going to revolutionize dentistry and has been certified by the American Dental Association. We wanted to see it done in person, so we invited the expert on the subject. Dr. Erwin Smigel of New York City, author of the book Dental Health and Dental Beauty. <laughs> Doctor, how did you first get the idea for tooth bonding? Well, the original impetus for it was to prevent decay in children. The first two steps that we use actually seal children's back teeth the surfaces where plaque and food particles could get into and prevents decay from starting. It's been very, very effective. How long does it last? Well, it should last, if done properly, a minimum of five years. In fairness, my next book has a 10-year study on bonding, and the results have been incredible. Like any other man-made product, uh, none of it is infallible. Crowns, uh, dentures, uh, all have a... Uh, a, a limited lifespan and bonding is similar but the results up to this point have truly been incredible doctor how many dentists are using this method now many many i've been lecturing now all over the world a lot of dentists are using this there's one company alone that has already sold thirty thousand of the ultraviolet lights and now there are several others that are doing it doctor what do you think the future is in dentistry actually sincerely i believe the future is here now it was always a dream if instead of grinding a tooth, we could bond the material to it so you could repair spaces between a tooth, repair a tooth that was fractured, cover discolored teeth. That was a dream that we thought might never come to pass. Today we can do it. Peak, Colorado, is protected on its east face by an 1,800-foot sheer climb. For Kevin Donnell, a professional guide and climber, and Roger Briggs, a teacher, it was the irresistible challenge. What you're about to see took more than 18 hours. Kevin and Roger scaled the east face of Long's Peak. We will follow their progress from the bottom of the slope to the almost tragic fall. Their only assistance was a steel pin driven into rock and a rope linking life to a fragile hold. Watch out, Kevin! Rock! Rock, Kevin! Rock! Oh, man. Okay. Watch me pretty close here. I got you. Let's see the real movie. All right. Hey, how far is it to the bivouac leg? I think it's supposed to be three pitches. All right, we're going to have to move really They do it now. because, as Roger says, it gives him a sense of his own mortality. To the rest of us, it's just plain scary. Yeah, really, from where I am is where it really starts. Our hammocks. All right. This is it for the night, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the most incredible time in their climb, at least to the uninitiated, is the coming of evening. 
The climbers bed down for the night some 13,000 feet in the air, 800 feet up sheer face of Long's Peak. They call it a climbing hammock. Oh, Whoa, no! Boy, look at that thing go. God. Yep. Careful that flake, that looks pretty weird. Okay. Great, looking good. They are near the summit, the most difficult part of the climb. Watch now as Kevin and Roger reach the point where a slip is near fatal. God, where are you sitting? I mean, yeah, I got a real nice little belay here. Whew. And then it's over. The battle is won. It's an incredible climb. What would you do if you put all your savings into a house and spent a lot more money having it decorated? Finally, you were satisfied it was home sweet home when suddenly things went wrong. All wrong. Whatever it is that's in this room, in this house, is eating away at the linoleum, and it's just destroying it. This is the home of Jean and Una Bonacore. A black oozing goo is taking over the house, and they've moved into the garage. I don't know what we're going to do. Nobody has the answers. We called the Environmental Agency Action Line, and she put me in touch with their quality call the pollution air testing and they hadn't run into anything quite like we were explaining then we talked to uh, the people at markel manufacturing they didn't feel it was the heaters then they didn't a, know what it was that's right it started three years ago very slightly well that one morning i went from electric razor in my medicine cabinet and the bottom shelf was just coated with this goo i guess you could call it We'd wake up one morning and we'd come into the room and there would, the spots would be. And I really was aggravated because before then, we were cleaning, always cleaning the television, the color television all the time. The screen would really coat with this goo and uh, we cleaned it and a couple of days later the same would come back again. And I cleaned the storm door and the paper towel was black and it seemed the more I cleaned, the more it would come back. And at that, we thought, you know, this is crazy. There's, you know, why is, what are we getting here? We thought, no, if it's coating everything like this, so, I mean, the refrigerator was starting to show and the uh, appliances in the utility room were starting to show. And we figured if it's coating everything like this, we have to be breathing it in. Mm -hmm. So that was when we moved out. Furniture was cleared and the house was barricaded. Last time I was over here, when we were called in to help move furniture, the odor was so bad, we had to put these air packs on. There's no way you could breathe without them. We uh, went into the crawl space, and we detected several odors there. Since we couldn't auger or drill in the, in the crawl space, we did the next best thing. We, we, we drilled into the ground. We put this pot 
over this, a couple of days later, we found that the odors from this hole caused this clay pot to deteriorate. The health department has no answers at the present time. My name's uh, Bill Callback Jr., and I work for the County of Cape May in the Engineers Department. And we're here in conjunction with the County Health Department and the environmental agencies trying to determine uh, the, the flow of this substance underground, um, the direction that it's coming from, and hopefully uh, who is responsible for this particular situation here. Up till now, pretty much unexplained, and we have no reason as of yet as to why this is happening. One day the sofa was fine, so we didn't rush getting it out of here. I come in the next day and it was starting to coat, and every day that you come in, it just keeps getting worse and worse. We get up and we look at the clothes, and, and here they'd be. They're just ruined. His pants, my coat, the shirts, everything. It's unbelievable. Their home always looked like a picture out of a house beautiful. Now it looks just like a disaster area. It's heartbreaking. We hope it doesn't go down any further. I'm the next house in line. We're hoping that it's really crude oil. <laughs> and we're hoping that an oil company would come in here and start putting up oil wells. <laughs> Get it out of here. I don't know, have any idea uh, how it's going to wind up. I don't know how long we can stay here. I don't know how long, uh, how we'll manage. I don't know where we'll go if we can't stay here. Um, you know, it's just something we have to take day by day. Until somebody finds the answer, we're going to try to live here in the garage. And if it comes into the garage, then I don't really know where we're going to go. In more than three years, no one has been able to determine what the smelly black ooze is, what caused it to occur, or how it might be gotten rid of. That is incredible. Well, that's, that's incredible for another week. We'd like to thank our guests, Jim Tyler, Dar Robinson, and Dr. Irwin Smigel for joining us. Next week, we'll have lots more that's incredible. You'll discover there are some invitations no one should accept. When this happy housefly goes to dinner with this exotic plant, he'll be unhappy to learn that he is the dinner. Alphabetically speaking, the letter D stands for dowsing. Some mysterious, almost mystical force allows certain people to find water underground with nothing more than a willow wand. The letter D also stands for dominoes. Patience, patience, and more patience. That's the rule when Bob Specker plays his incredible game of dominoes on our show next week. As we keep telling you, if you've seen or been a part of anything incredible, write and tell us about it because we'd like to have you join us on our program. Just drop us a line at P.O. Box 25989, Los Angeles, California, zip code 90025. And please include your telephone number. It saves time if we can call you. And we'd like to thank station WOI-TV, Des Moines, Iowa, for their contribution to this evening's show. Until we see you again, have yourself an incredible time. Good night. Like the man says, good night. Good night, everybody. Laps on the menu tomorrow night. First, the Fonz prepares to face his fate when an all-girl psycho gang decides to give him his last ride on Happy Days. Then Laverne panics when Shirley severs the buddy system and insists that Laverne learn to do things on her own. More laughs Thursday night. The fans go wild when Mork tries out for a berth with the Denver Bronco cheerleaders on Mork and Mindy. Then relive with Benson his first day on the job at the governor's mansion. And now, stay tuned for A Fistful of Dynamite, the Monday night movie.